it, this is about meaning. This is about the kinds of meanings we ascribe to these places and the reaction of um, some Navajo groups to this uh, sending ashes to mm. the moon, not the first time it's happened, um, is I think really interesting because we're taking places that we're introducing death to these planets. We're bringing a new category of being to them. That we're leaving the physical evidence of human death behind. And mm. this is not something that um, they've had before. This is not, so that will change how we think about them as well. And there are possibly profound implications. Attention all citizens of the future. Buckle up and step into our time tunnel of imagination to join us on an extraordinary journey into the days of futures past. Now, dust off your ray guns, polish your jetpacks, and tune in because today the future isn't just history, it's a rocket ship to thrilling stories and mind-bending possibilities. So let's go to our guide that excavator of the eventual, that historian of the hereafter, that recorder of retro futures, Theo Priestley. Hello and welcome again to another episode of Days of Futures Past, where I talk with a guest about the future that they saw as children, what was predicted, what didn't come true, and anything else in between. Today I have with me a very exciting guest because I love this geekery is Dr. Alice Gorman, an internationally recognised leader in the field of space archaeology and future um, author, I should say, of the award-winning book Dr. Space Junk vs. the Universe, Archaeology and the Future. She is a vice chair of the Global Expert Group on Sustainable Lunar Activities and this is the really cool part. Alice has an asteroid named after her. She has asteroid 551014 Gorman floating around in space. <laughs> Dr. Alice Gorman, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you for having me on, Theo. Um, I really have to understand, you know, how did you get into the whole, uh, you know, the whole field of archaeology and space junk? Because that to me is just, I think for the, the person listening, you know, what does that actually mean? Oh, well, it means that I look at space junk in Earth orbit, all of the stuff that we've left on the moon, on Mars, are scattered throughout the solar system. I'm looking at this stuff in exactly the same way as if it were a stone tool that you uh, come across doing an archaeological survey on the surface of the Earth. I'm looking at the what the materials and technology tell us about human ideas, uh, society and culture and politics at the time these objects were made. I'm looking at the relationships between the objects and their environments and each other uh, to do the same thing, to, to try and get inside people's heads. And people often say to me, well, like we're literally living through this right now. You don't have to get inside someone's head. You can just go and ask them. And that is true and it's amazing to be able to do that. But everybody experiences their world from their own perspective. And what, as an archaeologist, I'm looking at are large-scale patterns over time and over space. So no one person has that in their head. So while we, we use that to, you know, for all it's worth, because we don't get that chance in normal archaeology to ask people from the past what the hell was going on, uh, it, mm. it isn't actually a replacement for looking at these artefacts. So we're sending a lot of artefacts into space at the moment. Uh, and obviously the, the moon and now Mars, you know, has various rovers. We've set foot on the moon, left lots of uh, debris and detritus behind. There's um, plenty of satellites floating around in space and Elon Musk has a car flying around as well. I mean, should are we are we starting to basically pollute in inverted commas space with 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 human artifacts um, or you know is it something that we should be concerned about yes and no so so yes i absolutely believe we should be concerned about what we're putting up there and for what reasons and what the long term effects of that are going to be but 
what counts as junk or debris is a cultural thing. What counts as pollution is a cultural thing. So we draw the lines in interesting places sometimes. And, and I guess as an archaeologist, um, I mean, what we do is study trash. We study the stuff people leave behind. So these things are all uh, uh, coded messages from the past to the future, if you like. And mm-hmm. we, pr- we do want to keep, so- keep some of them. So, so they're not all... Not all junk is equal. Not all of this stuff is worthless. Some of some of this junk actually has uh, future purposes that we maybe can't foresee yet. Uh, maybe in being recycled and being reused. Maybe in forming the witness or the record of how humans engaged with space uh, from the twentieth century, uh, you know, right through to the centuries before us that we we. Well, probably someone like you has more insight into these centuries before us than most people, but but these objects can play play a role in navigating us between the, the past and the future. So so I think we need to just think about that a bit. We just don't want to say it's all junk, it can go. We have to have a more nuanced approach to this material, I believe. So in a way... Would you see uh, at some point in the future almost like like we have protected buildings and sites and excavation sites uh, across the world? We have the same kind of protection, protected rights for items that we have left during our exploration of space to basically give us that record for future generations to understand how we made those steps. Yes, and this is something that's been discussed very seriously in the space world at the moment, particularly in relation to the moon. So everyone is going back to the moon at the moment and this is going Mm. to potentially cause damage and destroy uh, places like, uh, you know, the Apollo 11 landing site at Tranquility Base. So preserving those for the future, so future generations have the same right to experience them or interrogate them or... Uh, use them as part of their own narratives or stories. Uh, so we do have to give some thought to how they would be protected in exactly the same way as sites and monuments on Earth. So you you grew up in the sixties. What was it like, actually? Um, uh, you know, I have to say, uh, did you witness the uh, the sixty nine um, moon landing firsthand? <laughs> I did, actually. I did. And I remember it so vividly. I was five years old. I went to a very tiny, tiny little country school from kindergarten to sixth grade. There were like 40 kids, the whole school, two teachers. The only television we had was in the headmaster's residence. And we all crowded in around this television to watch it. And because I was in, I guess I, I was in kindergarten, I think. And and we were the littlest ones, so we got to sit on the floor right in front of the television. There were no kids' heads blocking my view. And I just remember it so vividly. Like, in my mind, it was like in slow motion, which it kind of was. Um, and it's very black and white and grainy and BP. Um, but it left such an impression. Uh, just seeing that moment with my own eyes, well, through the medium of the television screen, uh, which, as I'm sure many of your listeners will know, those images came through the Honeysuckle Creek tracking station in Australia, so which I had no idea of at the time, of course. But, yeah, I remember it. I really remember it so well. And what, what did it do for you as a child then? Because, I mean, obviously you are on this path now um, in terms of space archaeology, but did you... You know, at that time, did it inspire you to, I guess, move into that sort of scientific direction as a child? Did you want to learn more or did that come much later as a result of that? It must have tied into my sort of scientific ambitions as a kid, but possibly more powerful than that was because I was on a farm, was the ability to look up at the night sky and see the entire Milky Way in, in, a, in a way that is, uh, you know, even on farms these days, the amount of light pollution uh, means that people still don't necessarily get that same view. And 
So I was entranced by looking at the stars. Then we had people who had been to the moon and I was also highly influenced um, by a set of scientific encyclopedias that my father had bought from a travelling encyclopedia sales person. Because when, when you lived in the country in those days, uh, you know, you didn't go into town that often. You didn't, there was no ordering stuff online. So people did literally drive around with the back of a truck filled with their wares. So the story is that my father, who made homebrew, plied this travelling salesman with quite a few bevies and this resulted in the purchase of these encyclopedias, which were actually terrific. So so all of this together, I think, um, led me to start reading science fiction as much as I could get my hands on in that context and to have ambitions to start dreaming about going into space, going to the stars. So what was your path from uh, during school to, to where you are now in terms of space archaeology? Because, well, you know, um, you know, I live in the UK uh, you, um, and we obviously have Cambridge and, uh, and Oxford and all these kind of sort of institutions, but you don't, and, and then you have, you know, Australia, which seems so far removed from where the space action is for a start. I mean, you've actually, uh, uh, so New, New Zealand and Australia has actually quite a good um, space sector. Um, I know um, uh, Catherine Q, who's um, on Twitter, as who's is, is actually quite a prolific uh, yes, um, I know astronomer and, and astrophysicist. <laughs> yeah. Um, but what, what what what's the what's the the space scene like in Australia just now? Well, you know, Theo, Australia has been in space since 1947, and we were the third nation to launch a satellite from within our own territorial borders. We were heavily involved in uh, all of the US's space program, the Apollo missions for one, but also um, Skylab uh, tracking of um, low Earth orbit satellites, uh, the Apollo Soyuz mission, um, experimental testing, defence stuff. We also uh, collaborated extensively with the UK in the Woomera rocket range and we hosted... Uh, the European Launcher Development Organisation, which was the precursor of the European Space Agency. So the whole ESA thing was tested out on Australian soil. So we have this very long tradition uh, in the space industry and in space science. But interestingly, a lot of it, I suppose, was quite inaccessible to people. And part of that is distance because a lot of this was taking place uh, in deserts in um, north of South Australia, uh, remote parts of WA, uh, and these are not um, places that are easy to get to. You couldn't just pop down to to the, um, what do they call it, where Cape Canaveral is, the Rocket Coast or something. You can't mm. just pop down and watch a rocket launch. Like you literally have to go thousands of kilometres to see this, and once you get there it's a high security facility. So we've got this very long tradition uh but we've had this recent resurgence, of course, with the establishment of our space agency in 2018. And I was I was part of a team of people who uh, made that come about, which I'm quite proud of. Um, but yes, New Zealand is doing great things in space as well. Uh, and some of us are encouraging a little bit more um, collaboration, trans-Tasman collaboration in the space sector. So Lots of stuff going on at the moment, launch sites being built, uh, local rockets, uh, satellites, incredible space science. So it's kind of an exciting time to be in Australia. Now, again, going back to the to the 60s and, and, and you growing up, I mean, what were the... What were, the, what were some of the other influences and visions that uh, you, you encountered as a child in terms of, you know, the future, what it was supposed to look like or that what the, the, the culture and society at the time was, was experiencing. Thinking about this, and there's, you know, incredible science fiction being written through this period with utopian and dystopian mm. and incredible future technologies, people living on the moon and Mars and the other planets, discovering life, all of this stuff. But thinking about this, I realised that, in fact, a lot of the futures that we were thinking about were extremely bleak and extremely mm. apocalyptic. And part of that was 
Well, just thinking of some of those influences, um, every night we would have the Vietnam War or the American War on the news. And as a kid, it just seemed like that was never going to end. So it was going the entire time I was alive up until 1975 when I was in grade five or whatever it was. So it seemed like there was this continual war. And Australia was kind of in the front line, the, the idea of the domino effect or the, the domino syndrome, that as nations fell to communism, they would fall like dominoes in a line. And we were kind of closer than um, any other so-called sort of Western nation um, at that time. So this was like a constant um, background here. You know, this is all very Cold War stuff as mm. well. So uh, there is that threat of nuclear holocaust, which was very um, vivid and present following um, the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki in 1945. And there was nuclear testing going on in Australia at the same time. But I guess some of the most powerful things that, that I remember um, sort of shaping visions of the future were, first of all, um, we would get the Peanuts cartoons every week in Australian newspapers. And I was kind of Lucy Van Pelt, if people remember this. Lucy was the dark-haired crabby one. Um, and she was a little bit mean as well. And I guess I kind of like that. And she was a huge fan of Rachel Carson, the author of Silent Spring, which was a, a book... There are two things that are kind of meant to have really catalyzed the 1960s environmental movement. One of them was the image of Earthrise, which was taken by the 1968 Apollo 8 mm. mission, showing the moon, the Earth rising over the horizon of the moon. And then there were other whole Earth pictures later on as well. And then the publication of Rachel Carson's book, Silent Spring, which was basically how the intense use of pesticides such as DDT were seeping into entire ecosystems and potentially um, poisoning um, rivers, um, working up the food chain from those little pests on crops that they were aimed at through to killing birds. So the Silent Spring reference is, is the idea that birds eat insects and the insects are poisoned and the birds will die and the next spring that comes will be silent. There will be no birds singing. So this was a real, um, very solidly scientifically based demonstration of what ecosystems, how ecosystems worked and how human activities were potentially causing them to collapse. So even though when I was a kid, like I read, I read the peanut cartoons, I learned the name Rachel Carson. So I didn't, I didn't know, I knew, I had some sense that she was writing about environments and ecologies. I didn't really know what or how, but even as, even in those days, there, there was this sense that this was something important. What Rachel Carson was doing was something really important. And, and that book was published in 1962. Uh, and, and another vision that was really powerful for me was uh, a book written by the English science fiction writer John Wyndham, who wrote quite a few interesting young adult fiction books. And this one was called The Chrysalids. Have you ever read The Chrysalids, Theo? No, no, I've not actually. It's, it's really worth a read. So... Uh, it was a book we studied at school, at primary school, and uh, I don't know about you, but if I have to study a book as part of a school subject, it usually leads me to hate that book so much. <laughs> but this is a book that has really stuck in my mind, and, and um, it's basically in a, a post-nuclear holocaust world where the level of radiation has caused mutations in in plants, animals, humans, and these children have developed a mutation, which is telepathy. Uh, and along with that are many other sort of uh, physical mutations as well. And they kind of escape through, um, you know, the horrific landscapes created by the nuclear war that had taken place. So it's very, it's very bleak and it's very 
powerful, ultimately kind of uplifting as well. When I think about that vision of the future, it was like that nuclear uh, devastation that was always on the verge of happening, uh, which you kind of, you know, as kids, not really aware of, like the, the, the details and the causes and the context are, are not things that you can easily take in, but reading... Mm books like that. So so the combination of those two things, like thinking here is this future world where there will be no birds, where spring will come and there will be no bird song, or where the level of radiation is causing mutations both potentially exciting and positive like uh, telepathy or horrific and um, all kinds of societies where the ne- the negotiation of identity is about where you sit on that spectrum of mutation. So that's there's not a lot of you know this isn't about jetpacks and going off to on holidays to the moon. This is about thinking about the different ways the world will end, and it's only really in in sort of thinking about this in preparing for our conversation. I'm kind of thinking, wow, like that was sort of normal for us thinking in that way. That was just the backdrop how we expected our lives to play out. It's quite a contrast from watching the moon landing and thinking, wow, the future looks great, yeah. and then a few years later reading all this bleak dystopia. I mean, it, it, to some extent, it reminds me of um, uh, Zed for Zachariah and also Threads, which were two uh, television movies that we watched mm-hmm. in... Uh, primary school again in the backdrop of nuclear holocaust and the cold war and um, and annihilation and uh, it's a wonder that we don't have an entire generation or two generations worth of uh, children or people who have been meant who weren't mentally scarred uh, (laughs) after watching this at such a young age um (laughs) <laughs> but it's 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 actually quite funny as well because when I was looking up uh, what else was running around in the sort of fifties and the sixties around the time that you were born, and it was a time of you know great optimism because again with other guests we've spoken about that kind of sort of optimistic future where the atomic age rather than causing annihilation was actually to power everything and all these weird mm. and wonderful gadgets that were going to be proliferated around our home jetpacks etc cetera, etc cetera, space travel. But funnily enough, there was an Australian astronomer called Richard van der Wright Woolley, uh, I believe his name was, or if I pronounced it correctly, um, who who basically said that interplanetary travel would be utter bilge. And I don't think anyone will ever put up enough money to do such a thing. What good would it do us? Uh, Which is quite interesting. (laughs) (laughs) Because only a few years later. (laughs) Yeah, only a few years later. Mm. Well, that's it, yeah. And look at us now. We're actually in, in a different kind of space race where it's actually private money, private companies who are at the vanguard mm. of, of that. I mean, do you see... I mean, do you see that continuing, obviously? that You know, we're in a situation now where even governmental organisations like NASA um, are now almost beholden to look to private space mm. companies to essentially get us to where we need to be as a multi-planetary species. So, you know, is is this something that we should just, you know, expect going forward? Yes, that's a, a really interesting question. So in the space world, everyone is absolutely enamoured of the kind of version of late capitalism which is driving contemporary space exploration mm. and in love with these private companies and all of the money that they bring into it, uh, which, you know, actually isn't as much as it seems because a lot of them are surviving on NASA contracts or DARPA contracts or something like that. So not necessarily, you know, the, the balance that we might think it is. So the, so the question about whether this kind of, this is going to continue long term, I think is a really interesting one. I think there's probably a decade or so in it, but I also wouldn't be surprised if at some point that, you know, the bubble bursts, so it's like the South Sea bubble and it'll go, be like bang mm. and then everybody um, 
we'll be be sort of saying, well, you know, where where was where were the profits in this anyway? And um, some individuals. So some of this stuff is definitely driven by individual ambitions. And, you know, if they die or lose interest or decide that it's not worth it, uh, where does that leave these partnerships Mm. as well? And I think something that people are, or maybe space agencies and national space programs are starting to lose a bit of half. Like, so something we've been saying in Australia as well, we don't actually have a national Space vision yet, so it's so right. we're very much going down sort of industry is industry path. This is where all the innovation will come from, blah blah blah. So I, you know that's not necessarily true. I think there's plenty of literature which demonstrates innovation comes from all kinds of places, and in fact, space industries can be hugely conservative, just doing things the way they've been done before. This is what's expressed in the concept of engineering heritage. So you demonstrate mm. something works and then that's the basis on which you get the next contract and the next contract. So space uh, space organisations can be very, very conservative and very non-innovative when it comes down to it. So I think there is a lack of, of broad scientific visions of what we're doing out there. Uh, I mean, there's plenty of uh, questions that need answering. There's plenty of uh, unresolved um, big picture things about what even the Earth is and what these other planets are doing and what's going to happen to them. We're not necessarily mm. setting ourselves up well to answer those when the the goal is being seen simply as moving on to the next planet or uh, developing the capacity to, to mine local resources. So, I mean, the, the, some of these things are dependent on each other. So, like a local lunar economy, sure, that's going to be really helpful uh, in sustaining the kind of science mm. that we want. But uh, a lot of these things are not being motivated by science and a lot of them are motivated by defence and security issues, whether we like it mm. um, or not. Okay, I don't like it, but that's what's happening. So, yeah, I don't know. I think um, it would be quite interesting how this plays out in the future. Yeah, I know uh, Jeff Bezos' uh, vision with uh, Blue Origin, I think, stems way back from when he was at high school or, or university or college. Um, and he wants to move heavy industry off Earth and almost make the Earth a, oh. a, a, a national reserve or a planetary reserve where it's basically protected and and everything else, all mining, etc., mm. just starts taking place on on different planets like the Moon and Mars and whatever. Um, I know, I, I, and it's yeah, it's a very noble vision. But like you say, it's 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 driven by well, one one an individual, but two, an individual that really needs to continually drive the capital into it in, mm. uh, and rely mm. on you know governmental contracts and. That can only happen as so far as when things are successful, because as we've seen, you know, yeah. once the, um, you know, time and again, once we've seen the, you know, various programs fail or have a catastrophic disaster, we, the, you know, the space industry tends to withdraw in on itself, and then it's another couple of decades before we see any action again. And you know, there's a big um, watershed coming do you up, think- which is sorry, go on, Theo. No, 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 go ahead, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, the first time someone dies actually in space or on the surface of another mm. planet, this is something we haven't had to deal with. Bizarrely, you would have thought somebody, some more people would have died. I don't want to, mm. I'm not wishing this to happen, but most deaths in space have, have occurred on the ground or in the process of taking off or returning. They haven't happened on the moon or in orbit or on Mars. When that happens... That is going to change public perception, I think, mm. in a big way, and it's it's probably it's probably inevitable. Uh, it's probably it's more than you know, uh, if a if a vessel full of space tourists encounters mm. some terrible accident, you know, this is going to have an effect on investment, and we haven't yet had to deal with this circumstance. So I think it could be a game changer. 
I think you're right. Although it's a morbid subject, I think the idea yeah. of um, you know of uh, a tourism, you know, the, the, there's a capsule floating around in space with a bunch of people that you can't recover, or even mm. uh, lunar astronauts. You know, like you say, you, you, there's a crash landing of something, and of course there's the debris, but also the fact that there are human bodies up there. And what do you do with that? And I, I suppose that goes back to the beginning of the of in terms of the archaeology archaeological mm. aspect mm. which is do you mount a, 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 an effort to recover that or do you actually preserve that as a site of you know not national but global importance that reminds us of how dangerous and how precarious living in space really is yeah such interesting question so the you would imagine that the expense of a recovery mission or one that was only to do that uh, couldn't be justified, and yet, well, we've mm. just seen, you know, um, the the recent Peregrine mission that didn't actually end up yep. with the moon. Um, details were a little bit hard to get, but there's meant to be um, ashes of more than one person present on that. That's a bit bit different. These are things those people choose, which or their families were choosing to do. Um, but it, it, this is about meaning. This is about the kinds of meanings we ascribe to these places and the reaction of um, some Navajo groups to this uh, sending ashes mm. to the moon, not the first time it's happened, um, is I think really interesting because we're taking places that we're introducing death to these planets. We're bringing a new category of being to them. That we're leaving the physical evidence of human death behind, and mm. this is not something that um, they've had before. This is not, but that will change how we think about them as well, and there are possibly profound implications for that. I reckon. We are going off into more. I think that goes back territory. Sorry. No, no, no. I think it's a really interesting point because you know we take space for granted as you know as open access and being for everybody, but then we we also forget the cultural significance of you know indigenous people who have mythology and uh, religious um, uh, uh, papers and 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 traditions based on bodies in space, uh, whether it's the moon, whether it's different planetary bodies, or whether it's the stars themselves, and, and how we impact that with our own you know, actions, I think hasn't been really taken into consideration at all, because it's all been around science rather than faith or, 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 or myth. Mm. Is, is there, is there um, do you see then a, a, a point in in the future for Australia to have, you know, more launch capabilities, but especially with the, the land mass that Australia has, you, you would think it's actually quite prime to build something as big, yeah. almost as big as Cape Canaveral in a sense. We actually have at least four launch sites currently either operational or in development. Mm -hmm. So this is definitely something that's going to become bigger. They're, they're all aimed at a commercial market. Uh, and NASA has already launched some rockets from uh, the Equatorial Launch Australia facility uh, up on up in Arnhem Land. Uh, uh, Gilmore Space is, I think, nearly finished constructing their launch site in the Bowen Basin in Queensland. We have Southern Launch with two sites um, in South Australia, there's also a central Australian spaceport, and I think one other under development. And this is a this is really interesting um, in terms of Australian space history, because you know, once upon a time in the heyday of Woomera, uh, we were one of the most active launch nations in the world. This kind of came to an end um, in the early 1970s when the Apollo mission wound down, and when the European Space Agency uh, being formed in the early 60s, decided to set up headquarters at Kourou in French Guiana. So all of this launch activity kind of halted. 
And then there were decades where if you mentioned launch in Australia, people would give you death glares. Like seriously, they would. <laughs> like they would treat you like you were the biggest idiot. And government policies during that time specifically uh, forbade thinking about launch in Australia, like explicitly. And um, what came as a kind of a surprise to all of us, so this was in train even before the space agency was formed in 2018, there were some companies who were just like, oh, we're just going to do it. Like, like right, we're just going to get out there and start building rockets. And these are the ones who are kind of now a bit ahead of the curve, I guess. So, so when this happened, everybody was like, and well, then I guess we got government and agency sort of support for this idea. And everybody's like, well, we never thought this would happen in Australia ever, ever again. <laughs> and here we are. So it is kind of exciting. Uh, tell us a bit more about the book, Dr. Space Junk versus the Universe. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this is kind of a book about, about space archaeology and about human culture and uh, the, the cultural and social meanings of the places and the artefacts that we've sent into space. And I suppose along the way, I kind of draw in a lot of other stuff um, as well. Uh, so some of it is thinking about sort of what is the future of our kind of engagement with the cosmos, if you like. Mm -hmm. And thinking about the emotional aspects of what we're doing in space as well because, you know, we're very used to thinking of this in scientific or engineering terms, but nobody would stump the money up to go into space. There were, was not an emotional investment uh, in being mm. in space. Uh, so, so I do sort of discuss... Um, um, colonialist and patriarchal um, drivers for going into space. And um, there are many of those. Um, and because mm. my background is in Indigenous heritage management, uh, I also talk about uh, what happened at the Woomera uh, rocket launch range when Aboriginal people were basically thrown out um, and excluded from their own country. So a lot of discussion of that kind of stuff, I guess. Uh, so, yeah, it's just kind of an exploration based on objects and material culture and places about how we can interpret uh, the human movement into space and what it means and where we might go in, in the future, I guess, based through an archaeologist's eyes. I think it's really important to actually maintain that kind of sort of human and emotional side rather uh, on top of the scientific and obviously the, uh, unfortunately, you know, the capitalist mentality mm. of, of moving into space and the defence aspect as well, which is where, where most of the money comes from. But it is a very human endeavour. It is, you know, uh, to some people, the survival of civilization and the species. But there is that kind of, I still think there's a very large part in terms of the human desire to explore um, and discover mm -hmm. um, as part of that. Um, it... I hope you're not too disappointed, Theo, if I tell you that uh, I have large sections of my book in which I am dismantling the idea that the urge to explore is actually part of human nature. Ah, <laughs> uh, and interesting. Is... Yeah, well, <laughs> you might have to read it to get... <laughs> My full argument of this, but th these are very um, culturally, temporally situated ideas. And, and I suppose as an archaeologist, someone who studies human behaviour into the deep past, we don't actually have any archaeological evidence that this is an intrinsic part of human nature. Interesting. So, yeah, so I guess I'm kind of a bit sceptical about the construction and if you also think about it, so these are very, these are concepts that vary between times and places and cultures and even genders. So the idea that humanity is intrinsically 
curious and wants to find out stuff is all well and good. But uh, in sometimes in places, women were punished for being curious. It was not held to be a virtue mm. or something that women should be. And Indigenous people are generally not held to have this urge to explore. So there's some just interesting cultural stuff around this, I reckon. Um, and, you know, like women were excluded from um, being astronauts for, for until, um, well, still in the USSR, Valentina Tereshkova aside, hardly any mm. um, female cosmonauts. Um, the last one, Yulia, um, I forget her last name now, was, was told, you know, space is not an appropriate career for women. And it took the US until 1978 to admit the first women uh, into the astronaut corps. So that's not humanity. It's a, you know, a human urge to explore, which is only for men. Huh. So mm. not so much anymore, fortunately. But globally, space industry is only 20% women because, and all right, I'm just going to come out and say this, and a lot of men aren't even aware they hold these attitudes. We're not smart enough to do engineering and science. So we have to continually battle to demonstrate that we are smart enough and people don't realise that's the, the opinion they start out with. So, so you know, urges to explore belonging to all humanity. Some of us have had to fight a little bit harder to be allowed to do that than others. How, do we, how do we get that? Cheers. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's far too early for me for a glass of wine, but <laughs> um, I'll, I'll raise a glass <laughs> later. <laughs> um, so... So how do we, how do we tackle that problem in terms of school and in, uh, and STEM subjects and getting more um, girls and women involved in the space sector? Then I mean, th there has to be a path forward. Uh, we can't just, I guess, rely on people just to make those decisions. You know, there has yeah. to be something that, that that pushes pushes them towards it. Yeah, there also has to be. <laughs> you're going to regret. Well, it was me who put us on this topic path. So. Yeah. Uh, look, so much effort has... <laughs> Not at all. I can't say you're going to regret it. Um, well, some of this has to be holding men back. Also, it's not just we can do all of the let's inspire girls, let's, you know, da da da, -da mm. and all that stuff's important. But we also have to have um, men recognising their limitations and recognising that sometimes they have to step aside and there's hardly any of that going on. But the good news is, so the International Astronautical Federation... Uh, has a, pro a, a motto, I suppose you might call it, the three Gs, generation, geography, and gender. So they're taking this stuff seriously. Uh, the United Nations um, Office of Outer Space Affairs uh, has a program called Space for Women, uh, which is uh, setting up mentoring programs, producing high-level policy documents, uh, you know, attempting to sort of change the... Um, what do I call it, the culture of the industry, I guess. And, and you know, I talk to a lot of people. That one of the main issues, I guess, I think, and, I mean, you alluded to it before, like it goes all the way up and all the way down. Like how do we get into people's kitchens and sort of start to reshape mm. how people are seeing, how little kids are kind of seeing their future, um, you know, when they're five-year-olds. So, how, you know, how do, how do we do that? And then how do we um, get more women at those upper senior levels so in our spacey bit we kind of have to think about um what actions we can take um in this moment and uh on an individual level as well but something i find all the time is there's so many men of goodwill out there in the space industry they genuinely want to see this change and they're genuinely devoted to trying to make it change but they're profoundly ill-informed profoundly they have never read a feminist book in their lives. They don't understand the issues. They don't understand how their own behaviour contributes to this stuff. They've never done the work on themselves. And I would just love to form a reading group and get a whole bunch of blokes to sit around and read <laughs> Simone de Beauvoir's The Second Sex. I would love to see that shit happen. Um, so this is, this is a major impediment. It's not enough to have a desire to change things. You have to be informed. And you have to work on it. So I'm sure a lot of those space blokes of goodwill, um, if any of them are listening to this, yeah, go get a book out of the library, read some shit, 
inform yourselves, come back to us. We're waiting and ready to listen. I think that is a great place to actually end the podcast because I just want that point to last um, and be the last thing that people remember. No, 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 seriously, I think, <laughs> I think it's great. Um, where can people find out more about you then? Uh, well, um, if I can do a plug. Um, Absolutely. Dr. Space Junk versus the Universe, Archaeology and the Future is a really good and accessible. It's written for the, a general audience. Um, a good way to find out more about space archaeology and um, some of the themes you've touched on and more. Um, I also write a lot for The Conversation, uh, which uh, if, you, if you, I don't know, Google me and The Conversation, um, a lot of my ideas are kind of expounded in short articles that are quite easy to read. Um, I've got a couple of TEDx talks um, online. Um, is there anything else that would be useful? Um, um, a bunch of stuff um, is out there and relatively um, accessible. So, yeah, it'd be great if people wanted to read more about space archaeology. One final point, actually, is um, and maybe this will be something that we can put up on the show notes, is um, where can we see the asteroid? Uh, <laughs> or how can we see the asteroid? <laughs> I do have some pictures of it. It's only little. It's just two kilometres um, in diameter. Um, and I think you'd probably need a pretty good telescope to try and see it. It is in the main asteroid belt. Um and right. I think if um, the International Astronomical Union um, as a tier of all of these minor bodies might have sort of further details of its, like, coordinates or, or, or how to find it, but um, I've only ever seen photographs of it. I should make somebody with a good telescope take me out so I can see my little asteroid uh, in the flesh. <laughs> Dr. Alice Gorman, this has been fascinating and I've absolutely yeah. loved being able to discuss this with you. Um, thank you very much for taking the time to be on the show. Thank you so much for inviting me, Theo, and having such wonderful questions. Um, that's it for another episode of Days of Futures Past. Please join me on another one uh, where I'll be discussing with a future guest, you know, the future, um, what they inspired them as children and where they think the future might go. This is Days of Futures Past, signing off, when we'll once again peel back the curtain on more lost futures. Stay tuned, and remember, the future may be here, but the past never fades. Until next time. Days of Futures Past was brought to you by Theo Priestley, keynote speaker, author, and retrofuturist. If you'd like to appear as a guest and reminisce about futures gone by, get in touch. I've been your radio host, Andrew Helbig. Goodbye for now.